once again good morning. It's good to be in the Lord's house. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 5. The Gospel of Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. We'll begin reading when you find your place in verse 1. Luke chapter 5 verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And when he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish, that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come before you this morning in the precious name of Jesus, and we pray God, as we've read your word, that it would sink now into our hearts and into our minds. Father, I pray that we could understand and apply it to our lives. Let us hear now the word of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been studying in the book of Luke, and so far we've gone through the infant narrative, the birth of of John the Baptist, the birth of Jesus, the short period of his childhood that that the book of Luke lets us in on. Then we move on into the ministry of John the Baptist and how he was proclaiming that the Messiah would come and proclaiming the kingdom of God was coming. And then Christ did come, was baptized by John. Christ, after his baptism, was anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descended on his shoulders like a dove. He then went, was driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. After that, Jesus returned back. He began a ministry in the southern part of Israel, in Judea, and then he moved to the northern part into Galilee. That's where we find him teaching in the synagogues and them trying to kill him because of the message that he was preaching. But then we find he began to heal. He started his healing ministry and all of that. And now we come to chapter 5 where he is about to officially call his disciples. Now, you may be thinking this is probably over a year into the ministry and he's just now calling his disciples. But what we need to understand here is if you go and compare the Gospels. Have you ever heard of the harmony of the Gospels? That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you can kind of compare all the Gospels and when things actually took place. Well, the disciples had been partially with Jesus. They had heard his message. Jesus had already been into Simon's house. But now was the time. Now was the time when Jesus was calling them into full-time ministry. When Jesus was calling them to leave everything and follow him. And we come now in Luke chapter 5 and we see this. That now these men are getting to know the real Jesus. And that's what I want us to see this morning through this text. Is seeing the real Jesus. Seeing the real Jesus. As we look at our text, I think there's several things going to come out here. We see that they heard his message. They heard his message. They witnessed his power. They recognized his holiness. 
they received his call and they left all and followed him. This is what we're going to be seeing as this passage unfolds. First of all, we begin now in verse 1. Oh, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. Now, now Christ's fame had been spreading to this point, and people knew that Christ was healing people, but his primary ministry was teaching and preaching the word of God. He would teach and preach in the synagogues as much as he could, but the people were pressing in on him so much, and they wanted to hear the message that he was preaching so much that at times he would have to preach it outdoors so everybody could hear. And on this occasion, we find that people are wanting to hear the word of God, and then Christ comes to the shore of Gennesaret. Now, this is also, you've heard the Sea of Galilee. Gennesaret and Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, that's the same body of water. Anyway, we find that Christ sees the boats where Peter, and we call him Simon in this text, but where Simon and the other disciples are fishing. He gets into Simon's boat and he says, put out a little bit so I can teach the people and they can hear me. So that's what takes place here. But we see that not only do the people hear the message, not only do those seeking to, to, to hear Christ teach more hear the message, but also Simon and these other future disciples are also hearing the message. Now I'm sure this was not the first time that they had heard Christ preach. I'm sure this wasn't the first time that they had heard Christ expound the word of God, but this was the first time that they really heard. They really heard what Jesus had to say. Now, I'm sure they had heard other things, and they were very interested in the gospel. They were very interested in the message of Christ. They had seen Christ do works, but this time something was different. This time when they heard, they really heard. I don't know if you've ever thought of it like this before, but there are times when you can be talking to me and I might hear what you're saying, but I'm really not listening to what you're saying. I have, a pro I have to really focus my attention to understand. There's also times in a church when you may hear a message. You may hear me preach a message a, a hundred different times and hear this certain statement, but one time, maybe it's me preaching again or maybe it's a guest speaker and they come and they preach a message and you hear it and it may be something that you've heard a hundred times, but you really hear it this time. It's like the Holy Spirit of God opens up your heart and shows you this truth that you've been missing for so long. That's what happened with the disciples at this time. Of course they've heard Christ preach. Of course they've heard the message, but Christ open their hearts to the message it's like when I was a child I was raised going to church I was going to church nine months before I was born and so there I was in church and church and church all the time I heard the gospel I heard uh, Bible stories taught and preached I heard the message of Christ dying on the cross and I would tell you as a child that I loved Jesus and I believe that there was a real sense in which I did however it became real for me one night when I was laying in my bed, I evidently had heard a message not long before then, and I was laying in my bed thinking about that message, thinking about when Christ died for my sins and what it means to be forgiven of my sins. And that night, the Holy Spirit of God was dealing with my heart and was drawing me to himself. And he convicted me and he revealed to me that I was a sinner and he drew me by his grace to trust in him alone for salvation. That night when I was seven years old, I had heard the message, but that night I really heard the message. And there may, you, there may be some of you in here this morning, you might have heard the gospel preached over and over and over again. You may have heard messages, you may have heard Sunday school lessons, but you need to really hear the gospel that the gospel of Jesus Christ is really for you that Jesus is really the son of God he really died on the cross taking the wrath of God the holy hatred of God against sin on himself and you need to hear that message for maybe the first time today and then the, maybe the Holy Spirit will draw you and convict you this is connected with the gospel and drawing salvation but also maybe you're saved but maybe you've heard the message that you need to follow Christ every day of your life. 
You need to be sold out to Jesus Christ. You need to be on fire for God. You need to, to move out from being a mediocre Christian, a, a sea average Christian, and you need to truly step out by faith and begin to serve God every day. You need to step off the throne of your heart and Christ needs to be placed on the throne of your heart. You need to I understand we believe that Christ is Lord and if you're saved, He is your Lord. However, sometimes we don't practically live that out. Am I right? Sometimes we still live our lives like we're our own Lord. Sometimes we live our life like we're in control. We go places we want to go. We say things we want to say. We try to find pleasures that we want. And we don't ever consider whether or not this brings glory to God. Well, we need to hear the message to follow fully fully uh, Christ this morning. So anyway, we see that first of all, they heard the message Jesus taught. We see number three, uh, verse 3. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the people. We need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. But that's not where this them getting to know the real Jesus stopped for them. They didn't only hear his message, they witnessed his power. After Jesus uh, concluded his message... Uh, Jesus turned around to Simon and said, Simon, why don't you put out in the deep a little bit and cast your net and catch some fish for us? Peter said, Oh, Jesus, I have been fishing all night. We fished all night. We didn't get one thing. We fished on this side of the boat and there was nothing. We fished on that side of the boat and there was nothing. We fished on that part of the lake and we caught nothing. And we fished over there on that part of the lake and there was nothing. There are no fish to catch. They're just not here. Have you ever had a fishing trip like that? There's just no fish to be caught anywhere. And Jesus said, well, no, but, but then Peter went ahead and said, but at your word, at your word, we'll do it. I, I, I don't feel like it's going to be done, Jesus. I've done, I've tried it. I've been doing it all night. But because you said do it, I do have faith in you. And so I'm going to do what you say. Even if I don't catch any fish, I won't be disappointed that I obeyed you because you told me to do it. So they go and they cast the net over the side of the boat, over the side of the boat. And when they begin to pull it back, they can't pull it in. Why? Because they look down in the water and there is a huge mess of fish in the nets. Peter had just been fishing in this spot and there were no fish. And now where there were absolutely no fish, there is schools and schools of fish, scores of fish. Here they are in his net. So many fish that he couldn't pull the net back on the boat. The others in the boat couldn't pull it in. They had to get someone else to come on their boat and try to help them catch this uh, mess of fish. And it began to sink both boats. Now, I want you to understand something. Peter and these other disciples, the other fishermen, this was their livelihood. This was their job. They had never seen anything like this in their lives. They had never witnessed. It was as if every fish in the lake and even more came to their nets. He knew something. Peter knew something. The other disciples knew something. They knew that they had seen a work of God. And this caused them, they witnessed the power of God. Now I want you to understand that they witnessed the power of God before. Jesus stepped into Peter's home. His mother-in-law was dying because she was so sick. And Jesus called her and raised her up and she was healed. I think that meant a lot to Peter and his family. But that didn't affect Peter even as much as this miracle. Why? I don't know why God chooses to open our hearts at certain times. But God chose to open Peter's heart at this time and show him something big from the works of Christ. So here we see that number one, they heard his word. Number two, they witnessed his power. There are two particular types of power that they witnessed on this day. And I want us to look at them. Number one, he witnessed the omniscience of God. The omniscience of Jesus. Now what does that mean? What in the world does omniscience mean? He knew everything. You see, sometimes we have to just realize that we don't know everything, right? But Jesus knows everything. Jesus has all knowledge. The Lord has all knowledge. Sometimes we sit back and something goes wrong in our life and we say, why God, why did you let this go wrong? Why am I suffering like this? But we have to remember sometimes we don't know everything. 
We don't know the end from the beginning. We don't know the circums all the circumstances of life. We don't know every piece of information in the world that there is, but Jesus does. And thanks be unto God that Jesus does. So they witnessed the omniscience of Christ. How did they witness the omniscience of Christ? Jesus knew where the fish were. Peter didn't know where the fish were. Peter thought he knew where the fish were. Peter thought he knew a whole lot about fishing, but Peter learned this day he didn't know much as Je he didn't know as much as Jesus knew. So he witnessed the omniscience of Jesus. Number two, he witnessed the omnipotence of Jesus. What is that? That's his. He is all powerful. Not only did Jesus know where the fish were. Get this. Not only did Jesus know where the fish were, Jesus told the fish to go there. Jesus commanded the fish to be where Peter cast the net. So not only did Peter witness the omniscience of Jesus, Peter witnessed the omnipotence of Jesus. We need to realize sometimes, we preached a few weeks ago that in the book of Psalms where it says, Be still and know that I am God. He is God. He is all-powerful and we are not. We don't control the events of this life. We don't control things in this world. But God does control. Jesus does control. And so on this day, Peter learned something about Jesus that he knew everything. And Peter could rest in the all-knowing mind of Jesus Christ. But Peter also witnessed that Jesus had power over everything. And so G Peter could rest in the power of God. We try to do things in this life. We try to manipulate circumstances. We try to work so hard to do things. But sometimes we just need to stop and realize that Jesus Christ has all power. And he's all powerful. So Peter witnessed and the other disciples witnessed the omniscience and the omnipotence of Jesus. Number three, they recognized his holiness. Now we're getting somewhere. They recognized his holiness. So Jesus taught the message. He preached. Then Jesus said, go out into the deep and cast your net into the water. They did it and they see this miracle of the fish. And then notice what happens with Peter. In verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Peter heard the message. Peter had seen Christ do other great works. Peter had heard Jesus uh, preach other messages. Peter had heard and Peter had seen. But on this day, Peter really heard and Peter really saw because God opened his eyes. And when God opened his eyes... Peter was scared to death. Why? Because he realized something. For the first time, Peter realized that he was in the presence of holy God. He was standing before holy God. Now, in the Old Testament, when people would see angels, they would fall to their faces and they would plead that they wouldn't kill them because they thought that if you saw something as holy as an angel, you would die. When, when, when people heard a word from heaven and God began to speak to them, people would, 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 would hide away from it. When Moses went up on the mountain and he was in the presence of God and his face, well, after he came down from the mountain, his face was shining. The people of Israel, they put a cloak over Moses' face and said, we don't even want to look at your face because you are in the presence of God. There is something about the holiness of God. There is something about the holiness of God. I, I believe this is something we need to get here. God is completely holy. God is completely sovereign. He's completely righteous. His holiness is infinite. And Peter realized something that we need to realize. He realized that the one who could see the depths of the lake and see where the fishes were, the one who could see the depths of the lake could also see the depths of his sinful heart. And it made Peter afraid. Get away from me, Jesus. Now, understand, this is Peter in a young Christian state saying, get away from me. But Peter responded correctly by recognizing the holiness of God. Later on, Jesus would ask the disciples, who do men say that I am? And the, the disciples would say, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're John the Baptist. But then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, Peter first realized this truth on the lake shore of Galilee. 
or by the Sea of Gennesaret, he first realized it there and he began to grow in that knowledge and understand more things about the holiness of God and more things about the character of God. But he first learned it on this day. He first learned it on this day when he recognized Christ and his holiness. What should this do with us? We should understand that Christ is holy. We should understand that he is holy and it should move us to worship. Peter fell to his knees. Peter bowed down before the holiness of Christ. We should be moved to worship. As we're getting to know the biblical Jesus... We're going, trying to go story for story, section for section, verse by verse, learning about Jesus. The more you learn about Jesus, listen to this, the more you learn about Jesus, the more you should be moved to worship Jesus because everything about him is worth worshiping. Every moment of his life, Every deed that he did, every time he displayed his power, every time he preached the word, everything about Jesus is worth worshiping. So to know him is to love him. To know him and to love him is to worship him. Christ desires that you worship him. And this response by Peter is exactly what Christ wanted because Christ was beginning to open up the eyes of Peter that he would see him and truly know him. I wonder how many of us truly know him today. We know him in, in almost different blocks. Sometimes we, we learn some things about him when we were children. We learn that Jesus loves the little children. The problem is that sometimes we, stick, we stay there. We don't, we don't grow in knowledge of him. Our knowledge never goes beyond what we were told when we were a child. You need to press on to know him. You need to know this wonder-working Savior. You need to know this truth-teaching Savior. You need to know this Holy Savior. How are you going to know Him? It is by reading the Word of God so He can open up His truth to you. You will not know God. Listen, you will not know God. You will not come to know Jesus any better uh, in the future than you know Him today if you do not open up your Bibles and read it. You must get to know Him the only way He provided for you to know Him, and that's through the Word of God. Get to know Jesus in the Scriptures, and you will be moved to worship Him. You will be moved to love Him. You will be moved to desire to know Him more. We can look at examples in the Old Testament. There is in Genesis 18 where God began to speak to Abraham in some ways, and Abraham fell on his face before God. Job in Job 42 verse uh, verses 5 and 6 in prior chapters to Job 42 Job was questioning God God why would you do this you know what Job went through God allowed his family to be taken away his money to be taken away everything to be taken away his health and Job began to question some things about God and then you see about three or four chapters where God begins to tell Job who he is where were you Job when I measured out the earth in the palm of my hand where were you Job when I did this where were you when I did that finally in Job 40, in a, a, a Job uh, 42, Job says, I will put my hand over my mouth. I will not speak anymore because I've seen some things about God. He was getting to know God in a deeper way and it moved him to be in awe of God. So they recognized his holiness. And I plead with you, press on to know Christ as this, but you'll only find that through his word. Then we see that they received his call. They received his call. They were afraid. It begins to describe who they were that were there, who those were that were there. Then we see in verse 10, And so also there were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. Did not be We see that Peter's fear was met by mercy. Isn't that good? Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. I am making you to become fishers of men. Now, sometimes we view this and we say that, well, Jesus is calling him to go and catch men. Th that is what he's saying, but he's saying more than that. He's saying you will. He's not saying you may. See, we get confused in the wording of Christ. Jesus didn't say you may catch men. Jesus said... He gave a promise here. This isn't just a commission to go out and try to do it. This is a promise that you, you will catch men. You will be fishers of men. You will do this. 
And so Peter hears the call of God. I, I say much like the call of God in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah was called up before God and he saw God high and holy sitting on his throne. The Bible said the train of his robe filled the temple. Fire was coming from him. Angels were flying around the throne of God and that their only job night and day for eternity is to say holy, holy, holy. Holy, Those angels are flying around the throne. And then Isaiah looks at himself and he says, Oh God, I am, woe is me. Woe is me for I am done. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And then one of the angels took with the tongue and took one of the fire, one of the uh, coal off the altar and touched his lips with it. And Isaiah said, My lips, my sins were purified and purged. And then God said, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord, send me. He recognized the call of God. Just as the disciples recognized this promise and they recognized the call of God, Jesus called Peter and said, Your job right now is to fish for fish, but I'm changing that about you, Peter. He didn't notice something. He didn't ask Peter's permission. He didn't ask Peter's permission. He, didn't, he did not appeal to Peter's free will. He said, here's the, here's the deal, Peter. You're not going to be catching fish anymore. If you do try to go out and catch fish, then you're sinning. So I'm talking about as a job. So you're not going to be catching fish anymore. You're going to be catching men. Here, I'm changing this about you, Peter. Peter heard the call of God. And he answered the call. The other disciples heard the call of God. They received it. They embraced it. They now wanted it because it was the God who put this call on their hearts to do this work. And church, we need to recognize today that we have received the same call. You have the same calling on your life that the disciples had. Now, I know God hasn't called us all into full-time ministry. I understand that. But God has called us all into ministry. And you are to be going out, sharing the gospel with people, telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ, planting the seed, sowing the seed, casting the rod, fishing for men. That's what you're to do. And if you're not actively pursuing the call of God in your life, then you need to repent and begin to do it. This is what God called us to do. This is God's word, not mine. This is God saying, not Matt's opinion. And God's called us to be fishers of men, so we must be about the Father's business doing what He calls us to do. Do receive the call as they received His call. But then we see finally, the very ending in verse 11. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything. They left everything and followed him. Now, that's an amazing statement. It's a convicting statement. But I believe it's a calling on us. Now, I know leaving everything, God may not change your occupation. You, if you were uh, worked in a certain company, you may still be working in that certain company after you receive the call of God. I'm not saying God's going to change that for you, but here's what you're doing. You're giving your life to Him as a blank check. Saying, Lord, whatever you call me to do, I'm, I'm not going to have to think about it. I'm not going to have to think, think it through or even pray about it. Here's what I'm going to do. God, I give you my life as a blank check. You fill out how much. You fill out the where. You fill out the why. You fill out the when. You fill out where I go. God, I give my life to you because here's what the disciples did. First of all, they left all. They said, there's nothing in this world that's holding me back from serving Jesus Christ. Money? I'm leaving it. Relationships? They mean nothing to me anymore when compared to my relationship with Christ. No matter what it is, I give myself to Him and I'm willing to follow Him wherever He may go. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though the world uh, tries to stop me, I'm still going to follow because I have abandoned everything, including myself. Including my self-will, including my self-desires, including the things that bring me pleasure. Everything, I am willing to give it up all on the altar of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing means anything to me compared to what Christ means to me. Is this your heart? Is this your heart this morning? Have you, have you received the call of God? Have you submitted? Have you abandoned yourself to Christ? But not only do they abandon, they left everything. 
total abandon. Then it says they followed him. They followed him. This is changing. This is a change in direction. This is a changing in the direction of your life. I'm going to follow Jesus. If Jesus says go to church, you know what? I don't care how good the fishing is that day or the hunting is that day. I'm going to be in church. I don't care what's going on in the sports world. I'm going to be in church. I don't care what other people are calling me to. I'm going to be with the people of God when I'm supposed to be because I'm following Jesus and I'm not following myself anymore. It, 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 it's, it's, I, I don't care what this world wants for me. I want what Jesus wants for me. I'm going to be fish. I'm going to become a fisher of men because that's what that's the direction Jesus is headed. And hey, buddy, I'm following Jesus. People think I'm weird. That's fine. I'm following Jesus. People says that I'm crazy. That's fine. I'm following Jesus. Whatever He says goes, and I'm following Him. Follow Him. Abandon yourself and follow Him. The high cost of being a disciple of Jesus, the high cost of being a follower of Christ, you give up everything. Jesus would tell, Jesus would tell a parable later on. It's called the Pearl of Great Price. He said there was a merchant who sought after fine pearls. That was his life. That was what he sought after. That was his job. He was a merchant of fine pearls. And it says one day he found the pearl of great price. And when it says a pearl of great price, it doesn't just mean the best pearl he's ever seen. It meant it was the most valuable pearl that exists. There nothing can compare to this pearl. But there's only one way he could receive that pearl. Only one way. There's only one way he could have that pearl for it to be his own. That was to, give, that was to sell everything he had. To rid his life of everything. Because that was the cost of the pearl of great price. Now, he could keep everything and, and, and life could maintain its status quo and go just like it was going, but he wouldn't have the pearl of great price. He said this pearl is worth giving up everything for. So he sold everything and he got the pearl. Now, here's the question for us today. Is Jesus worth everything to you? Or would you rather have certain pleasures of this life? that you may would have to repent of and forsake if you followed Christ. Is Jesus worth maybe losing some friendships? Is Jesus worth maybe losing some popularity? Is Jesus worth maybe giving effort and giving our lives for the cause of Christ? Is Jesus worth these things? If He is, then follow hard after Jesus. But if you have to say, you know what, it's just not worth that much to me. I'd rather make more money. Serving Christ fully would cost me money, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to make money. Well, you go ahead and make money. But the Bible says, what, what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You may keep making that money, but one day you're going to make that money and bring it to hell, and it's not going to be worth anything. Or you can follow after Jesus. You can give your life to Him. You can serve Him. You say, Brother Matt, what, why are you preaching this to us? Well, because that's what's next in the text. They followed Jesus. Will you follow Jesus? You may be here this morning in one or two situations. You may be here this morning and you may not be saved. You may have realized throughout hearing this message that you are not a believer. You are not saved. What do you need to do? What is there for you? You need to come to Jesus. You need to repent of your sins and you need to embrace His forgiveness and trust Him this morning. That's what you need. That's the only thing that's going to meet the needs of your heart. You may be here this day and you may be saved. You may have trusted Christ and embraced the Lord Jesus. However, you know in your life you've not been following Him as He's called you. There may have been a time in your life where you followed Him and He was number one, but you've allowed other things to creep in. You need to repent of those things. You need to, you need to come away from those things. And you need to allow Christ to be number one. Christ to be Lord of your life. That's what you need to do. Let's pray. Father.